Welcome back to Seager's Summit on Female Leadership in Sport. Ben Jacobs with you. It's day three. We're fast coming to a close of this three-day event, the penultimate panel to come, plenty of keynote speeches as well. And if you've missed a panel, that is available on YouTube. You can follow us on social media as well, SIG Alliance on Twitter and Instagram as well. We're doing live stories. Thanks to Andalea, a member of our Sega Youth Council, who is running Instagram brilliantly. And it would be great also if you could send us a photograph of your home office, because I want to try and build a picture of how many countries are represented. So send a photograph if you're watching the conference with a flag of the country where you're from and your name as well, although I can probably get that from most of your handles too. And have some fun with it as well. Maybe you have a photograph of you with a child or a pet anything that basically makes us laugh or smile or we go, ah, oh, that's really cute, would put a smile on our face. And in addition to that, you might even get a like from one of the seeker handles as well. So, so far we've had over a thousand delegates and 50 countries represented. And I should also just point out that when you are engaging with us through the app and the website, you will see a donate now button. And if you do have the means to donate, it would be greatly appreciated, even if it's just a small donation. Of course, we won't say no to something in the hundreds or thousands, but your money will be going towards championing sport integrity. Do get in contact with us as well if you'd like to be a Seagull mentor and you're a more established member of the sports or integrity industry. We're always looking for new mentors. Right, let's move swiftly on then to our penultimate webinar. It's called Sports Sponsorship and Integrity, Commercializing the Women's Game. We're delighted for this to be joined by Tom Corbett, the Group Head of Sponsorship and Media at Barclays. From the RNA, we welcome their Commercial Partnerships Director, John Espley. Alongside those two, we've got Marzina Bogdanovitz, who is the Head of Marketing and Commercial for Women's Football at the Football Association, and a great friend of Seeger's, Alison Giordano, the VP of Global Consumer Marketing and Sponsorships at MasterCard, completes this panel. And your moderator is from Octagon, their Creative Director, Lizzie Hamer. Lizzie, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us for this panel. It's sure to be um, a top one on the sports sponsorship and integrity. I'm going to work with the panel to see how we commercialize the women's game. So women's sport is sport. However, despite the advancements, there's a big disparity between the men's game and the women's, both in revenue, airtime, media coverage and fans. So I've got four brilliant speakers with me today who are going to talk about today's landscape, how the brands and the right holders can really commercialize the game, and then what the future kind of looks like and how we can make it a really kind of strong way to progress. I'm going to pass to the panel, starting with Ali, um, who's and each of them are going to personally introduce themselves and then we'll jump into the questions. Thanks so much, Lizzie. Um, really a pleasure to be here and um, you know, proud to be here as MasterCard is a, a, is a founding member of SEGA. Um, I'm Ali Giordano. Um, as, as I was introduced, um, I am in the Global Consumer Marketing and Sponsorship Group at MasterCard. Um, I have uh, responsibility from everything from golf to rugby to football um, ac across a number of passion areas. But I also help guide our gender balance strategy through the organization, um, through a number of different activities that we have um, that, that covers our integrated marketing communications, as well as our society and, and our employee pillars. Back to you, Lizzie. Excellent. Well, then I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself next, then followed by John and Tom. Thanks, Lizzie. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I look after the women's game, so marketing commercial uh, for women's football. Now, um, it's, a, it's a slightly different position within the FA. We have a head of broadcast, we have head of sales, head of, head of marketing, um, and I'm on the side to that as a head of marketing commercial for the women's game. Uh, I don't really have a team. I have one person that works with me, but essentially I integrate with everyone else's team so that the whole of marketing commercial actually have to work together and we're integrated. And I've always said, um, and I've said it to my colleagues at the FA, that if I do my job, my role won't be needed in a few years time. So they're not putting me out there yet, but actually if I've done my job, then the women's game is totally integrated within the FA and my role isn't needed anymore because it's all done. Um, and, and I have to say, where we started off from to where we are now, there's a huge difference. So that's me. 
Thank you. Over to you, John. Hello, everyone. My name is John Espley. I am the Director of Commercial Partnerships at the RNA. Um, my role encompasses both looking after our existing sponsorship partners that we've got at the RNA, and that's principally across all of our three professional championships. So the Open, the AIG Women's Open and the Senior Open, as well as getting out there in the market looking for new sponsors to try and become involved with all our events and our, our properties. Um, as the governing body for the game, our interest at the RNA and our remit sits across all aspects of the sport. And we would say our simple but ambitious purpose is to try and make golf more accessible, appealing and inclusive and to ensure it's thriving in 50 years from now. And I think when we start to look at the areas that we can focus on to have the greatest impact as we look to deliver upon that purpose, growing the number of women and girls who play the game, follow the game or interact with it in any way is, is arguably the area where we think is the greatest potential. There's 70 or 37 million lapsed female golfers out there, which is worth a potential $35 billion within the industry. So for us, we believe the potential for growth is enormous and it's uh, yeah, massively exciting. Excellent, thank you. And Tom? Hi everyone, I'm Tom Corbett. I'm the Group Head of Sponsorship at Barclays. Uh, we've got uh, a long-standing history in football um, as a long-standing partner of the Premier League and more recently as the title sponsor of the, the Barclays Women's Super League and, and, a girls foot, and the Girls Football Schools Partnership. Uh, and excited to be here today and, and talking about all things women's sport, women's football. Thank you very much and thank you all for your time. Let's jump straight into it. We've obviously got kind of experts in football and golf, especially, but obviously it's the brands that we want to hear from for, uh, as well. So let's start with a bit of the state of the play. So what does the world of kind of women's football look like today? And what are some of those barriers? I'm going to obviously pass that to you, Martin. Thanks, Lizzie. Um, I think women's football has changed dramatically over the last three years. Um, we, we had a bit of a hiccup 50 years ago, but to be honest, now where we are, in terms of the exponential rise in the game, uh, we've, we've smashed all our targets of our game plan for growth that was our ambition um, last year. And we're now onto our new strategy. And you know, people have said to me, what do, what do you do? What is important? And, I, and how does it compare? For me, I look at the women's game and the men's game as you've got the M1 motorway, fully signposted, it's got four lanes, massive, everyone knows where they're going. That's the men's game. On the flip side, you've got an overgrown footpath, which is very much how I feel is the women's game. And we're desperately trying to clear it and make, and make good signposts. We're probably on a, on a bridal way now and moving a lot further forward than we were, but that's the, the challenge that we've had is actually we've got to clear that footpath and make way and get it as clearly signposted as the men's game. And then we'll really achieve what we're trying to do. And the, the, the beauty of the World Cup from 2019 and the interest that we've had is that we've got masses of people are now trying to come down this footpath and we're trying to get all the diggers and everyone else on board to try and clear it with us. So um, as a big task ahead, we've got a long way to go, but certainly we're on the right track. Tom, just out of interest, how do you feel about being sort of a, a partner that is on that footpath with the kind of the FA trying to kind of help everybody get down that runway? Yeah, look, we, we feel very proud to be part of that journey. And I think the way Marjan has just described it is, is spot on. I mean, you know, from our side, when we started a couple of years back now, the, the transformation even in that time um, is is amazing in terms of how how we've seen you know broadcasting deals being done. Uh, we've seen you know record attendance figures, record girls playing football and and getting involved. So you know over such a short period of time, there has been so much progress. So you know we we are incredibly proud to be part of that. We always talk about this sort of shift from a a vicious circle to a, a virtuous circle and it and it really feels like we're, we're getting there as there's all these knock-on effects of more investment in the game broadcasting in the game shining a spotlight on on talent on on and off the field that then drives that that greater interest and, and you know there are still challenges lots of them but it really feels like we're moving in the right direction and we, we should hopefully be on Margena's M1 soon. <laughs> Love it. Um, and kind of swinging across to golf, 
there's a pun in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> what do you think, John, is kind of the role of the rights holders in really sort of developing the women's game? Um, and can it have a kind of a bigger impact on the sports industry as a whole? All these metaphors to keep up with, I'm gonna to have to up my game. Um, <laughs> no, I, th I think the role that rights holders have in championing the women's game is absolutely massive. I think both through what we can directly control ourselves, but equally by the power and influence that we have over other key players in the sporting ecosystem required to, to drive change and develop women's sport. And I think I'm principally thinking about fans as well as the, the media and the sponsorship partners here. I would say um, at the RNA, as both a, a rights owner and um, of the AIG Women's Open, um, as well as the governing body. And we feel an, an enormous responsibility to take a real leadership position within our sport and to actually drive that change. I think with, with that in mind, um, in 2018, we launched the, the Women and Girls Golf Charter. So this was a charter that we created, which was aimed to inspire an industry-wide commitment to developing a better and more inclusive culture within golf all over the world. And ultimately, the aim there to, to increase participation on women and girls, but really getting more women and girls involved in the golf industry itself. And what we've done there by launching this charter, effectively ask our affiliates to, and all of our partners around the globe to pledge their support and to make a difference, make their own individual commitments, no matter how big or, or how small they may be. And it's been going pretty well um, to date. Um, we've got over 700 organizations, including MasterCard, of course, who signed up to the charter and made their own commitments, all with a massive degree of, of scale. Um, and we've recently released a couple of impact studies, which are tangible case studies on some organizations out there that have, have made change. And some of them are small, some of them are just creating membership, uh, mentorship programs, their dedicated working groups and, and raising awareness through um, the worlds that they live in within golf, but everyone's making a small impact. And, and for us, it's been a huge demonstration that if we work together, um, we can make an impact and as a rights owner and rights holder and governing body we've driven a bit of change we've we've had people come along the journey with us um, and we're starting to see, see a real difference there but we can't do it alone you know we need to engage with the wider industry as a whole and work together if we've got any chance of making a true long-term impact yeah it certainly takes more than an individual um, governing body to be able to do it I'm going to quickly cross back to Mark Zena about kind of how you've looked at building that kind of grassroots of the FA um, and if you've had some kind of particular successes or challenges along the way. I think one of the areas that we've really worked hard on is in terms of extending the number of, of brands and commercial partners we have and you know and I'm thrilled that we work with Tom at Barclays. Um, I look back and in 2016 we had five partners possibly six um, that were invested in the women's game. Whereas now we have 13 partners that are absolutely invested in the women's game. And, and I think the difference is that we ask them, you know, are you gonna come with us on this journey? And we have to have a shared purpose. It's not about branding on a shirt or perimeter boards or LEDs nowadays as they are. Um, or backdrops. It's about actually having a shared vision and a shared purpose. And, and with that, we can help grow the game. We've, we've recently announced Weetabix as, as our Wildcats partner. Wildcats, we only introduced as a, a girls only game for girls to have fun, make friends, play football. We introduced that just two and a half years ago. Um, and it's grown massively with 1200 centers with huge plans for it going forward. There's so much that we're now doing to try and build it, but actually doing it with partners and, and that relationship that we built and started with, with Tom at Barclays to try and build the, the Barclays Women's Super League, um, we're smashing all records and I'm, I'm thrilled about that. And I, and I think that is gonna help us really drive the game forward across credibility in terms of showing that the sport is credible. And then also at the lower end, inspiring young girls to have um, an opportunity, both in playing football or playing sport or in confidence. I agree more. Um, Tom, would you like to kind of talk to us a little bit about that kind of meaningful role that a sponsor can play? Um, I'm assuming the partnership with FA has got to be one that works for both parties. Yeah, look, absolutely. It's a, it's a question I get asked, asked a lot and it sometimes ties into the, the broader question around 
and the broader challenge around how do you measure activity in particularly in certain areas of, of women's sport that, that might be, you know, at a much earlier stage of their development than say the equivalent in, in the men's game. And, you know, that, I know that is a challenge for many people. Um, and, you know, connected to that for us, our, our, our commitment and our partnership with, with the FA is, is really much more about purpose and society. So it's about the impact that we can have and how we can facilitate the ability for more girls to play football. It's as simple as that. It's it's not football for football's sake, but it's about the opportunities that playing football creates and gives. And it's about that equality, equal access to the game that that, that boys have. And for us, that's kind of the, the true measure of, of success in, in all of this. Um, you know, the, the more girls that get access to play, um, and indeed the, the more girls that get to see the talent on the pitch, um, you know, we see the interest grow, we, we see the sport grow, um, and in turn, the, the, the commercial sustainability of it starts to improve as well. Just on that kind of commercial model, obviously there's a disparity between kind of the difference of the, the men's and the women's game. How do you justify that kind of that reach and engagement? Um, and are there other benefits that kind of weigh in as you're measuring? Yeah, again, it's a it's a question we get a lot, and cl clearly, you know, it it is it is difficult for us to compare, and in fact, we don't compare because they are two very different properties, and they are at two very different stages of of their of their life. Um, you know, the, the the women's super league has only been professional now for a couple of years, um, and you know, we are committed as are the FA to making it sustainable in the long term. So it is very difficult to compare the two at the moment. Um, you know, as I say, for us, that the success is is very much about the, the ability for for girls to play, and that that's that's truly how we measure it. You know, I'm in a very we don't we don't have any hard and fast commercial measures against our our women's partnership. Um, easier to do so on the men's side of things, I will say, and that's we benefit. You know that that comes from the scale and the reach of men's football, which the women's game doesn't have at the moment. I'm absolutely sure that will change in in the future, but we're on that we're on that journey together, and it and it's it's too early to do that. But, but in short, Lizzie, we 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 don't compare. Um, we 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 don't. It's good to hear that um, you and Marjana are kind of singing off the same hymn sheet, as in it's not like for like. And I think it's also something that kind of Ali and the team at MasterCard have also been talking around kind of not comparing sports, but kind of making sure that they're independent of each other. Um, Ali, I guess I kind of wanted to ask you around sort of how do you influence like women's portrayal in the kind of the sponsorship activations and campaigns that you do? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think in a couple of ways um, that, that we do and I think other brands um, you know, do or should do. Um, there's so many external tools out there and, and, and partners that we have, as well as uh, leveraging our employee base to ensure our communications are void of bias and stereotypes. Um, you know, we're a partner of the ANA um, in the United States and they have a see her movement. And from there, they created a GEM score, which is a gender equity measure. And we use that as a rating tool to look at all of our communications um, across the globe. Um, you know, I'm excited to say we've recently joined the UN Women's Unstereotype Alliance, which has a similar focus as the See Her movement. And, um, you know, looking to really benefit from all of the case studies and uh, thought leadership that, you know, that organization will be able to, to provide so that we can continue to um, ensure that we're, we're void of, of stereotype. Um, and then we also actually, um, this year have introduced a diversity and inclusion employee advisory council for our integrated marketing and communication. So our campaigns really run through a number of filters uh, to, to really ensure that we have representation and that we're um, positioning really everything that we do in, in the most optimal way. Um, so that would be, I think, on the tools front. I think the other um, area that uh, you know, that we focus on, and, and Marzana, you talked a little bit about grassroots, um, and, 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 and John as well, when we think about grassroots all the way to the elite level, um, I think that's where we've been able to add value and we'll continue to add value, whether it's in um, grassroots rugby in South Africa, um, or, you know, partnering with John and the team at the RNA um, on uh, the Women and Girls Charter, right? So 
you know, we're involved in, you know, providing curriculums around STEM and golf, right? And, and actually rolling that out to other passions, but really trying to get more girls into the game um, and also more women into the business of golf, right? Um, in, in, in that instance specifically. So really that development of the game across, you know, playing and, and, and business, um, but also creating opportunities for fans. Um, I, the, the team is on the call here has spoken about the importance of fans and getting closer to their passion. So, you know, uh, us taking our activation approach and applying it equally to our women's investments and really allowing those fans to engage with their heroes. Um, just on Monday, we launched Priceless Surprises with Arsenal and we, uh, we sent surprise gifts to the development team, um, you know, young girls who, you know, are, are just getting into football, who look up to the, the Arsenal women as their heroes and created a Zoom call where they were surprised and um, got to meet them and, and ask questions. And so really getting that um, opportunity for these girls to see her so they can be her, which is, you know, the, um, the mantra that we've all um, gotten to know. Um, but then I think the other the other way we've influenced women's portrayal um, is is focusing on the moments of visibility for women's athletes. Um, I think uh, you know Tom, you mentioned shining a spotlight on and off the field for these athletes. Um, that's something that's really core to you know Mastercard is is, is creating moments, um, creating experiences, and um, you know these amazing women. How we can showcase their personalities? How can we even give them a voice? to share what they stand for as, as people. Um, Lizzie, I know we, we worked on an amazing project um, last fall with, with Naomi and Billie Jean. I don't know if you wanna share um, your thoughts on that, on that experience, but um, it really was the idea to give, to give these women a voice. I definitely think there's um, an amazing opportunity to kind of give women a voice in, in all sorts of different manners, whether it's the campaign activation of sponsorship um, it actually kind of makes me think about John and how you were describing sort of less about kind of this um, uh, measurement, if you will, of kind of the, the reach and engagement and actually more about kind of the storytelling side that you work with your partners on. John, do you want to just explain a little bit of that for us? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I guess we're, um, yeah, as the, the, the owner of the AIG Women's Open, we have a fantastic sponsorship portfolio there. We've got some great partners. AIG are, are fantastic and will be a long term partner, as are MasterCard and, and many others. But naturally, we're obviously always in the market relatively aggressively looking to, to broaden the portfolio and, and better commercialize our championships. And for us, the, the selling and the messaging for our for prospective brands is pretty simple. It's in our view, selling sponsorships about demonstrating how versatile it can be as a marketing tool and that the success metrics that we touched upon shouldn't just be on the, the reach and the eyeballs. And there is a concern that at its very worst, sponsorship is just around media. It's basically advertising, but at its very best, it allows brands to, to communicate their core values to a massively engaged and passionate fan base. And I think that's the conversation we're trying to have with brands that we're talking to in the marketplace is trying to get them to be a bit braver and a bit bolder with how they position their partnerships and letting them realize that if they want to make a difference in, in, in the sport they invest in, they've got to do it through telling the right message to the right people and not just worrying and, and maybe turning their nose up a little bit at, at some of the female properties purely because they don't think the reach is there. And I think the more sophisticated brands are getting now within sponsorship, I think the more women's sport actually stands up as a fantastic opportunity. And um, if we can help these brands realize and understand that the investments need to resonate with their, their values and, and be more authentic and purpose driven, the women's sport can become an easier sell than men's sport in many ways. And that's what we're really excited about as we try and explore new opportunities um, with partners for, for the AIG Women's Open. On that note, um, Marjana, how do you think uh, rights holders should kind of uh, approach potential sponsors or do you wait for the sponsors to come to you? And what's that sort of strategy that you have surrounding them? Um, well, I've got to give a shout out to our sales team because they've done a, a phenomenal job, um, especially during COVID. We signed two new partners during um, last year with Vitality coming in as sponsor of the Women's FA Cup um, and, and then Weetabix. And, and, then, and then there's others followed since. Um, but I go back to what I said earlier, and I think, you know, Tom and I had a, had a great first meeting when we, we introduced each other and we just talked about the women's game. 
we didn't talk about contracts. We just talked about where we saw women's football going and the vision that we had, and it matched that of Barclays. And that as an example was sharing a purpose. And actually that for me is more important. So, and if, for example, if our sales team came to us with a brand um, that didn't have that shared vision, then I would probably say, actually, I'd rather walk away. I'd rather not work with a brand that wasn't committed to actually helping us on our journey to invest in the women's game at the highest level and, and at grassroots, because then you're just doing yourself damage, to be honest. You've got to have the right partner to work with. And we're fortunate that all of our partners that have come on board since, well, since 2017 have been amazing. Um, and, and that I think just shows the power that we've got and, and why it's done so well over the last three years. Tom, can I ask you to lift the lid on the FA? Like what's going on behind the scenes there? Anybody in particular that you like to work with? And <laughs> is that shared purpose uh, a, a, a true thing that we're talking about? Um, sure, yeah. Look, I mean, it, it, it is. I think, you know, we, we the, the, the partnership with the FA was a natural extension for us because of our role in football. So we, we were already there and with, with the development of the Women's Super League, it, it absolutely made sense for us to expand our focus or in fact, refocus some of our attention to the women's game where, where we saw it needed support. Um, and, and the opportunity to, to grow and develop. And, and absolutely that, that shared purpose was at the heart of it. And I know I've talked about it a lot, but it, you know, right at the center of this was um, the, the commitment between both sides to make football available to every girl in England by 2024. And, and that was the, the big thing for us. That's what got people excited at Barclays, that's got me excited, you know, and, and the team at the FA. And that's really what everyone's focused behind, as well as developing the professional league. Um, interestingly, the hardest sell for me was the professional league side of things. It was it was people who were you know, much more focused on the grassroots element and, and, and growing that because they saw it as such a need. We we fundamentally believe that you can't do one without the other and 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 the 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 um, sort of talent on, on the pitch is really the North Star of, of everything and, and particularly for young girls and boys to see. So yeah, absolutely that shared purpose is there. You know, I will also say as, as rights owners at the FA and for any rights owner, um, they are, there are some incredibly talented people there, but there are some people who understand businesses and, and corporates who are looking to get into this area and can really help you visualize what what this will look like and i don't think any rights owner should underestimate the, the impact of that particularly when you're you're dealing with big corporations like like mastercard like like barclays um uh, you know it, it isn't always simple and there's people who've got lots of experience in in that area that that help bring that to life and that shared purpose ali would you like to kind of step into that space of sort of shared purpose and i know mastercard hold several different sort of uh, sponsorship uh, sort of portfolio if you will are there certain ones that you lean towards because of that shared purpose or do all of them contain um, a different element of that um, I think shared purpose is is critical um, you know as Tom's saying we, you know I, I think about you know John when we started talking about you know coming together around the AIG Women's Open and and really initially you know the Women and Girls Charter you know it was it was very much aligned with our purpose at MasterCard of designing, you know, a world with women in mind, um, you know, to create possibilities for everyone, right? So, so the idea that, you know, there was a focus on, you know, getting girls into the game, getting women into the game, um, whether it be on the playing field or, or you know, in the office, um, it, it was absolutely aligned because a lot of the things that, that exist in golf in terms of access and in terms of you know, women participation are very similar to the, the world of technology, right? There's a lot of similarities there. So mm -hmm. um, I think I think from that perspective, yeah, there, there's at least the, the direction we've taken as we've taken on new partners is, is making sure that we have an aligned vision um, and that, you know, they're as interested in breaking down barriers as we are um, in, in, in the industry that they're in, whether it be in, in golf, whether it be in football, mm -hmm. um, rugby, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I think it's super important and it's something that that um, we definitely take to heart. 
So we've definitely kind of discussed this. Um, I think John, uh, sorry, Tom sort of picked up this uh, robust circle of how do you get more eyeballs that drives more awareness that um, kind of keeps that positive cycle going. John, just building on that, like what do you see kind of the, the properties or the media partners, what can they do to increase that profile of women? Yeah, sure. I'll um, just give my experience. I'll, I'll answer this from the perspective of a, of a property owner, if I may, Lizzie. Um, and, and in simple terms, um, you know, we need to grow the scale of our events in, in absolutely every way we can. And I think in order to do this, I think it's really important that as the event operators, we stop looking at the female editions of sporting events in the same way we do the men's. I, I, th I think there's this tendency for property owners to simply sometimes replicate what works for them in the men's game and try mm. and attribute that to the women's game. But having a singular outlook or strategy that could be applied to both versions of the game or sport just doesn't work. So as any event should, women's sporting events should be afforded fresh thinking and fresh investment in order to thrive. And I think to use ourselves as an example, if I can um, show such hubris, um, you know, the <laughs> RNA, when we took control of the, the AIG Women's Open in 2019, we inherited the fantastic event with massive potential, but naturally we wanted to capitalize on the potential and make more from it from a from a commercial perspective to, to reinvest back into the women's game and as a result we've recently developed a completely refreshed commercial growth strategy specifically for that championship and it's been really exciting and it's it's um, enthused so many of us internally a lot of it is focused around the actual championship itself's brand strategy so how do we position the event in the market how do we better tell the story of these amazing athletes who play our championship how do we enhance and uplift the event experience to better drive the physical event day attendance and at the heart of everything there it's our desire to to champion the changing face as golf as we as we call it and taking this bold and more aggressive stance and everything we do that relates to this championship we hope will have a massive impact and I've, I've touched on the sponsorship side of things what i've mentioned there is more the sort of the event day revenues and building the brand but from that sponsorship perspective you know, we genuinely do believe that investing in women's sport can be incredibly attractive. It's, it's more accessible than the men's sport. It's um, at this point in time, it's relatively cost effective. And I think the fees are only gonna go higher as the, the market matures and that ROI is recognized. But the athletes have these incredible stories to tell and, and can be more engaging. So you know, we think there is just huge potential there, but as mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, it can't just be the rights holders and the owners itself. We need to have buying from fans, from the media to all right. support each other to make impact. Agreed. Um, Marjan, is there definitely kind of a need for fans to have like a responsibility for the sport? Like can fans actually help sort of build that new vision or do they have kind of a need to help those athletes rise? Absolutely. I think fans are hugely important to the success of women's sport in general, um, more, not just football. You know, we, we want to bring in new fans and, and introduce them and every fan can go away from what they see or what they take part in and introduce someone else. It's that nine, nine, 90 rule, you know, they expand, they can tell the story and, and fans that become engaged will tell their friends that actually, you know what, that was amazing. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It was, a, it was yeah. a breath of fresh air. It was different. I've never seen something. That's where the fans can come in. And I think fans can also be respectful, I think. And, and, see the credibility and, and John's already talked about these are athletes and performing at the highest level and fans respect that and they can tell others. And, and I think there's, there's an element where fans should almost monitor other fans. And I'm, I'm talking here about some of the things on social media at the moment. This is where fans should actually help control that space and actually talk positive. Let's not talk about negative. Let's, let's look at the opportunity that is there for young girls for the future across any sport. Um, and we're so used to just sitting back, whereas actually let's step forward and talk about the amazing um, performance of those players and, and what confidence young girls get from doing sport, whether it's team sport or individual sport, we've got to look at that. Yes, indeed, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's amazing how you see kind of um, people rise in business and the um, attitude that they bring with them that they've often developed from a sporting background as a youngster. So I think there's quite a lot of uh, wonderful crossover. Now we do have a couple of questions coming in from uh, different people. I've actually got one here for you, Tom. It's from Kara McKinney and Tom alluded to sponsorship agencies. 
So do right holders need to engage with sponsorship agencies or can they approach brands direct? This is being asked by Lizzie from Octagon, a sponsorship agency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that puts you in a difficult spot. Um, look, I, I think it either is, is, is appropriate. I mean, you know, our own personal experience is that the introduction to the team at the FA actually came via our sponsorship agency um, uh, for an informal conversation, nothing more than that. And, and it led to where we are today. And if they hadn't made that introduction, we wouldn't have been there. Equally, uh, you know, we tend to have relationships with many of the big rights owners, particularly in sport, who reach out to us on a regular basis. So I, I think it's a bit of both. I often think it's helpful to have a relationship with the agency because certainly for bigger organisations, that there's likely a connection with a, a broader piece of work around reviewing approach, portfolio, strategy. Um, but I think either is absolutely fine. Totally agree with you. I think uh, partnerships and relationships are obviously quite a powerful thing. And I think it's the that sort of work that you can see that's kind of builds those uh, purpose driven pieces. Now, we have actually got a question that is around sort of the campaigns and the projects and the sponsorships that are focused more on sort of values and social purpose. Um, the audience would like to know, like, are there any particular KPIs that you can look at when evaluating these things? So this question is from Aileen Kando. And I'm actually going to ask Ali, um, your work with sort of MasterCard, how do you um, evaluate some of the campaigns that go out um, if they are driven by sort of values and social purpose? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we we kind of look broadly across, uh, you know, typically leveraging social media channels, right, um, as a as sort of a prime, a, a prime channel for us. Um, but we we really look across a number of different things from engagement, uh, you know, in topics to, you know, um, uh, whether there's, you know, positive feedback in, in social, but also um, on the earn side, you know, and are we are we creating conversations, um, you know, whether it be with media and um also with fans, right, and 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 getting sort of the the conversation going, ensuring that you know, um, hopefully that the, the key messages that we're trying to get out in in partnership with the ambassador are are you know are out there and, and are being um, you know being socialized. So again, a, a, a number of different areas that we look at from on the paid side, on the earned side, um, but engagements and, and social is is also critical. John, I've got a feeling that you really want to add to Ali's kind of point of view. How could you tell? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, we're, we're doing a lot more work now to measure the quality of impact of the, the associations we have with partners. So we do a lot of research now through our database to map and, and, and to track and measure the sentiment, the preference, the regard of our sponsors based on specific campaigns that they operate. So I think it's a really nice way to delve deeper than just the quantitative stuff, have a look at how our audience has reacted to a campaign at MasterCard, or AIG may have done and then tap into our audience and ask them questions about what impact that had on their feeling towards the brand. And there's some really nice data that's come out of that and certainly is a good example for us to, to showcase to other partners when we're trying to encourage them to do you know, more meaningful activations themselves as well. Yeah, and just on that, John, I think it's great that the RNA does that with us and for us um, and, and, and your other sponsors. Um, and I think it's something that you know, other rights holders, you know, I think would benefit from as well. It, it strengthens the relationship. It allows you to kind of really align, you know, on, on objectives tightly um, and, and, and then build from whatever those results are. Now we've um, obviously got a couple of questions there about rugby. So um, I'm going to kind of throw a curveball to you all. But actually, it's fundamentally the question is about sort of how do you build a robust strategy um, that kind of changes the narrative of the sport so the example is women's rugby is vastly un, unfunded uh, underfunded ha, what can you do to change that narrative so that sponsors become interested um Marjana, have you been underfunded in football by any chance and how did you kind of get people interested well i think it's you know a lot of women's sport a lot of sport generally is underfunded um it's it's not just women's sport it's a lot of the, the smaller sports within the Olympics, for example, don't, don't have enough funding. And I think it's about 
actually being creative in what it is that you are offering. And going back to some of the discussions that we had, it's, you know, you don't go to a brand and say, look, I can give you three boards, a bit of hospitality and this, that, and the other. It's actually find out a little bit more about the business. What challenges do they have in the business? How can you help them solve those challenges? And actually looking at, you know, whether it's women's rugby or any other sport, how can you use your sport to help solve some of the challenges a business has, maybe internally, maybe externally, maybe within sales? It's actually just looking more than your standard sponsorship proposal, actually looking at how can you be creative to help address issues or challenges that that company has and help them find solutions. So you don't go and say, these are the rights that you're going to get. It's more about, we can help you achieve this in your business. It's thinking slightly more creatively, um, but sports that, you know, we haven't got enough money for this event, so therefore we need X amount for it. It doesn't work like that. You've got to show value and a return on investment. And also in, in terms of those me measurements, set the objectives at the beginning and agree those KPIs. So then you know what you're measuring later okay. on, because otherwise you're measuring something that you should have started off with at the beginning. Oh, it's music to my ears. Be more creative with your sponsorship assets. Yes, come on, I love it. <laughs> um, Tom, just kind of building on that, sort of how would you look at sort of having more brands become involved, um, especially in the women's game? Yeah, look, I, you know, and I, I appreciate for, for many of the rights owners, this is, this is very hard. Um, you know, I suppose on, on the football side of things, slightly ahead of where some some other sports are um not not all of them by the way but um you know and and it, and it is difficult i think this point around being creative about it and, and what can you do i suppose to um garner some of the interest is is an interesting one and i think you you, you do have to think very creatively you know we've talked about this a lot but i think what what the fa did very well as part of the uh, i think the, the the focus on the women's properties is um, is managed somewhat separately to the men's side of things. So it's given its own focus, uh, its own team, um, and so it operates um, and is managed in in the right way for for that environment, for that sport, for for that group of people. And we do exactly the same at, at Barclays. We don't treat it all as one big sort of part of sponsorship activity. And I suppose there's some learnings there from some of the, the rights holders. It's, it's difficult because it requires resource and it, it requires investment. And we get back to this sort of vicious cycle. But, you know, there are things that certainly in the early days have, have, have worked really well creatively. You know, I know one of the things that we love working on with, with the FA, and, and this is slightly further down the track, but is putting a spectacle on, on, on the women's game and, and hosting some of the the matches in in the men's stadiums now often that that creates a bit of um debate in the media particularly when it gets into ticket pricing as well and, and i don't want to um i'm not certainly not describing it as a stunt but it is a fantastic opportunity to shine a really big light on on the game to attract people to that environment that wouldn't normally go and get them to experience it and if you know five more people walk out of that stadium thinking i'm going to go back and i'm really interested and we've changed some of those perceptions. Um, that, for me, is is incredibly valuable. And of course, you know, some of those people can be um, people who are interested in in getting involved in the support in the sport and and supporting it as well. I don't think it's easy. I think it is a, a really big challenge, and it's 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 one that's going to take going to take time. The decoupling of kind of properties and sponsorship, we've seen that happen quite a lot globally. Um, Ali, MasterCard have kind of picked up certain sponsorships over others because of that. Um, is there a, a valid sort of opportunity there for brands? A hundred percent, yes. Um, you know, for many years, just traditionally, the women's game, the women's event, the women's property was thrown in. You were doing a men's deal and, oh, you got an added value, you know, women's event. Fantastic. I mean, if you think about it, it's, 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 it's crazy, right? Um, that is shifting. That is really shifting and it's shifting and, and, and thankfully it's shifting. And I think it's shifting because the rights holders are, are realizing it needs to be shifted, but the sponsors are demanding it, right? So, you know, 
separating them is extremely important. You need the women's mm -hmm. game, the women's event, the women's property to have, you know, its own identity, to have um, its own support as, as, as we're hearing, you know, um, it, 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 to, to this panel being as important as well. Um, it really will allow, I think it, it to stand on its own. It allows a sponsor to fully realize um, you know, the potential, optimize the relationship, really get very creative, um, you know, talk about it, talking about objectives earlier, right? You know, have very, very often and very likely you're going to have different objectives, you know, again, for every sponsorship. So, you know, allowing those objectives to be aligned with the women's game and, and, and the resources to be properly put behind them, um, you know, that, that's what's going to drive success here. Yeah. Would you like to build on that at all, John? Oh, hold on, I've got a, I've got a counter call, so I'm going straight over to Martina. Um, I was just going to say that I would decouple with caution because for mm -hmm. some brands, it's actually important to have both. So we, you know, a lot of our England sponsors are sponsors of the men and the women. So I, I, I don't prescribe that you go either one way with decoupling everything or you join everything up. The one thing I do agree with Ali is absolutely there is no bolt on of the women's game you get it free buy this you get this free you've got to offer the same value and the same proposition for men and women and then you're right the women's game sorry right. Justin. no i think it's perfect and i think being able to build those two different identities can work really well um and then it's kind of looking at how you pair them um john you've obviously been driving kind of very much a sort of a story around the female game in golf um, how has that kind of been for you? It's been it's worked really well. I think we're, we're really excited by it. You know, we we think that the the female athletes I have to say one of my my sister in law is an LPGA player, and I play golf relatively regularly with her. And every time I'm just blown away by how amazing she is. So for us, it's about focusing on on the athletes. That's where we think the story is. That's where we think we can make the event more engaging. Is focusing on the stories around the athletes and. You know, that's something that we'll continue to do with our storytelling and our marketing over the next few iterations of our championship. Awesome. Well, I don't think we've solved exactly how to commercialize the women's game, but we've definitely understood kind of the power of the story of the women's game. Um, I'm really kind of um, excited to see kind of what the future for sort of football, golf, Barclays MasterCard can be by championing that kind of that female story and by looking at the identity of the sport in itself. We'll certainly be chasing the rest of you for some more commercializations and putting that kind of wallet where that mouth is. Um, so yeah, thank you all for being part of this panel. Um, I could probably let you talk for hours more on this, but for now, I think we'll pass back to the studio. Hey everyone, it's Karen Kaur from the United States, currently working at Lakeshore Foundation as their Policy and Public Affairs Coordinator. I'm also currently a SEGA champion and on their SEGA Standing Committee on Gender, Race, Inclusion, and Diversity. What should sports organizations do to co-power girls and women in sport? Well, as a disabled woman in sport, my question is, what can sports organizations do to co-power disabled women and girls in sport? Well, the first thing that we can do is recognize that the inclusion and participation of women and girls with disabilities in sport is a global responsibility. The second thing that we can do is to provide women and girls with more opportunities for competitive and recreational sport. The third thing that we can do is involve women and girls with disabilities in all outreach programs. The fourth thing, showcase and have meaningful and impactful representation of disabled women and girls as successful athletes, successful coaches, successful role models, and successful leaders. And lastly, let us continue to include and prioritize disabled women and girls in governance and decision-making opportunities. Looking forward to expanding this conversation. Talk soon. Hello, my name is Michelle Chai. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Olympic Council of Malaysia, and I'm also a mentor on the SEGA Women Global Mentorship Program. Hello, my name is Maisa Saivis from Lebanon. I am a former Lebanese table tennis champion and currently a table tennis coach at Antonia University for physical education students. And I am a mentee on the SEGA Women Global Mentorship Program.
Throughout my 20 over years in sports, I've been fortunate enough to shadow some fantastic leaders, both male and female. Being able to have someone that I can always refer to not only gave me the confidence to chart my own path, but there was always someone available to be my sounding board and to nudge me in the right direction. Programs such as the SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program is crucial in encouraging young leaders to explore and push their boundaries within a safe environment. I urge all sports organizations to replicate such programs and atmospheres within their organization. For me, organizations must focus on Community Girls program at the grassroots level. It providing coaching and mentoring programs like SIGA Women will result in women investing mental and physical knowledge in the world of sports. Coming from the Middle East, women face difficulties in sports. Women involvement in sports is ignored as sports represents the risk of ethics, moral and religious beliefs. The only feature of changing the point of view of cultures and societies towards women, representation and leadership in sports is time. I'm really happy to be on the SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program with Mesa, who's an exceptional young female leader. I'm looking forward to sharing and exchanging my ideas with her. Thank you, SIGA Women, for this excellent program and the opportunity to connect with Michelle. I am sure I will benefit from her experience. Hello, my name is Sarah Soleimalle. I work at FIFA in the governance department for the member associations of FIFA. I'm a SIGA mentor within the SIGA Global Women Mentorship Program. And today I'm with my mentee, Taryn. Hi everyone, I'm Taryn Horner, a mentee on the program and also the Sport Engagement Lead at Newham College of Further Education in London. We welcome you to the Web Summit on Female Sport Leadership and we hope that you enjoy the week with us. Great. So, well, Taryn, what do you think should sport organizations do to empower girls uh, in sport? Thanks, Sarah. This is such an important topic of discussion and I think that it's highly important that all sports organizations and foundations are inclusive towards women and girls and specifically towards the youth because that's where we can have the most developmental impact. So it's highly important that sports organizations consider women's needs separate to those of their male counterparts and that they provide opportunities for women to be their best and reach their potential within sport and the development objectives. Well, that was great, Tarin. Thanks a lot. And do not forget to follow SIGA. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the week with us and use the hashtag SIGA woman, like, share and follow. Hi, I'm Jerice Cologne, CEO of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. I am so very excited to participate in SIGA's Summit on Female Leadership in Sport, especially uh, this March during Women's History Month. Um, SIGA has brought together an incredible group of uh, professional athletes, advocates, and those who support sport uh, together to really talk about some of the tough issues that each of us encounter. So I hope you will join us March 8th through 10th. Um, I'll see you there. Hello, my name is Marily Flores. I'm Women's Tournament Manager at FIFA, and I am a mentor on the SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program. Welcome to the SIGA Web Summit on Female Mentorship in Sports. I think that this program is very helpful because we can give our mentees the opportunity and also the tools that will help them to lead in this industry. Hello, my name is Carla Hernandez Valdez. I'm from Mexico City. I'm a sales planner at Honor Armor and I'm a mentee on the SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program. Welcome to the SIGA Web Summit on Female Mentorship in Sports. SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program gives me the opportunity to develop my leadership skills and grow my network. SIGA Women. Hello, my name is Dr. Lindsay Sarah Krasnoff. I'm a historian and research associate with the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS University of London, and I'm a mentor for the SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program. Hi, my name is Bethany Hushin, and I am a community manager at iSport Connect and also a part-time PhD student with the Institute of Sport Business at Loughborough University in London, and I am a mentee on the SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program. 
Among the many things that sports organizations can do to empower girls in sports is to be authentic, be engaging, be inclusive, but importantly, to grant them the space and the opportunity to thrive and take ownership. Mentorship programs like this one are really important, um, especially as a good way for people to learn off each other from different experiences, different knowledge, different backgrounds, and also to give a bit of an insight in terms of how people have faced challenges within working in sport and how we can face them, not just individually, but together. We hope you enjoyed the summit. Hashtag Sega Women. Hi, this is Vicky Conde, a former football player, coach, and now studying a master's in sports ethics and integrity. And I am a mentee in the Sega Women Global Mentorship Program. I think that sports organizations should have a plan not only to include uh, girls and women, but also to empower girls and women through sports. And it should be in their agendas and one of their priorities so they can develop future leaders. I also think that in order to achieve this, we also need more women in the decision-making roles so we can create more diverse teams. And personally, learning from other women, not only in the context of sports, but also outside of sports, has been an enriching, enriching experience. And having female representation in sports organizations is an important step for, for younger girls and women to believe that they can be a part of the future. And with that being said, welcome to the SIGA Web Summit on Female Mentorship in Sports. Hello everyone, I am Maureen Rosita Ojonga Bobisong. I am a social entrepreneur and uh, a sports and development specialist. I currently serve as program director for the SEED project and I am a proud mentee of the SEGA Young Females in Sports Mentoring Program. Now, tomorrow is the International Women's Day and SEGA has put together a three days web summit to really discuss on key themes that involve the empowerment of women in sports. I want to just, you know, put out this message and say that um, getting more women involved um, in the sports industry or young girls involved in sports cannot be done without the male counterparts, cannot be done without male mentors. I am an example of how much um, male counterparts and male mentors can really encourage a young woman to embrace her full potential and to encourage her to embrace opportunities around her environment. I would not be um, in the position I am today if I didn't have male mentors who encourage me, who, you know, um, push me forward and who really believe in me. So I believe that this web summit is an opportunity that Seeger is creating to bring stakeholders, you know, from around the world um, to really discuss about the future of sports and also how to encourage and empower more young girls and women um, to get involved in sport programs. And I encourage each and every one of you to get registered for this web summit, it's not too late. And of course, we're looking forward to all the exciting panels and the exciting um, um, information we are going to get tomorrow. Thank you, Sega. Hi, my name is Stacey Copeland and I'm a proud Sega champion and a member of the Sega Committee for Diversity and Inclusion. I'm here today at my granddad's boxing gym where I started out in sport as a little kid. And from there, I went on to represent my country in two sports, both football and boxing, and ultimately won the Commonwealth title as a professional boxer. Sport has given me some incredible opportunities. Going on a scholarship to America, I've been able to compete in Sweden, Brazil, Korea, Japan, Kazakhstan, and many, many more places. I've experienced different cultures, had incredible mentors, and learned so many lessons that apply to the rest of my life, and have allowed me to develop and flourish as a human being. Sport is one of the most powerful things on the planet for making a difference, and it really can show humanity at its very, very best. But in order to do that, we have to have equal access and opportunities for people, regardless of race, gender, sexuality, disability, class, background, whatever it might be. Please, please be part of that because without kids like me having opportunities in places like this, we cannot reach our full potential and you can be part of that. And you can be part of that by attending the SEGA Women in Leadership Conference from the 8th to the 10th of March. Please be there, please be part of this incredible movement. I stand on the shoulders of the people who came before and now it's our turn and your turn together collectively to stand strong, 
and make great opportunities for the next generation so that they can go on and do even better. So please join us and we'll see you there. Thanks. Hello, good evening from Doha in Qatar. My name's Karen, Karen Webb Moss, and I'm currently Senior Advisor to the Leadership of the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy and the Football World Cup here in Qatar in 2022. I am a proud mentor of the SEGA Women Global Mentorship Programme and um, a very, very warm welcome to the SEGA Summit on Female Mentorship in Sport. Despite the increase in women's competition, a uh, number of women's sports being, you know, getting onto programs such as the Olympic program, higher engaged audiences, and even uh, female domination in, in some sports, despite the number of women working in sport at a senior level, despite the the few, yes, unfortunately, just a few women that, that actually run governing bodies or organizing committees. Uh, despite the efforts of many organizations, primarily organizations such as SEGA, women still face significant obstacles in the world of sport. So let's have a, a look at some of these obstacles uh, that, that we face. Um, trying to sum them up is, is not easy, but I think it comes down to uh, one, the heritage, traditions of how sport is run, the governance of sport, the longevity of some of the, the presidents and the, the leadership. And uh, unfortunately, you know, they, these have been men for, for many years, many in terms after terms of, of, of leadership. And the other issue is really culture. And, and I think that that is, that's prime, whether that's culture within the organizations that govern sport. It's also the culture of, of grassroots clubs to sports on and off the, the field of play. Um, the culture of an organisation and the, um, tr the traditions that, that run it lead us to obstacles, barriers and issues such as um, equal access to roles, um, lack of female uh, opportunities for females with roles, workplace flexibility issues, lack of equal pay, inequality when it comes to media or sponsors, when it comes to TV rights for some of women's sports. Um, and particularly with the sponsorship, this leads to huge issues for um, women wanting to compete at an elite level regarding their preparation as well as their, their competi competition.